So this is a talk about science gateways. Uh, I'm going to do a quick introduction and definition uh, about them, just to show you that this is not a niche market. Actually, there are uh, quite a lot of people all around the globe uh, looking into this. So what's a science gateway? A science gateway is a set of tools, data, and applications that are integrated in a, in a web environment, behind a web portal usually. And usually these web portals are connected to larger infrastructures to support big computations or large data storage. So there is now an international coalition on science gateways. It was launched uh, just before summer actually. And all the major funding agencies and continents have uh, structures for this. Uh, it's Canary in Canada, but there is EGI in, uh, in Europe, uh, sciencegateways.org in the US, uh, Nectar in Australia. So it's, it's really uh, a big thing at the moment. In your informatics, uh, I guess you're familiar with some of these systems, but the number of science gateways is also increasing every day. Uh, and as we speak, I guess, uh, it started at the beginning of the 2000s, but now most of the projects and uh, different uh, domains are developing their own science gateway, either for computing or for data, or in general for both. So, uh, we can name, and this is just a, a, a reduced list of, uh, of projects, uh, we can name the Agavi platform in the US, the AMC Science Gateway in the Netherlands, Seabrain in Canada, uh, the HBP of course in, uh, in Europe, the Loney Pipeline in the, in the US, uh, Neugrid in Europe too. Also commercial uh, uh, companies uh, have started to uh, go into this business. Uh, I'm thinking of Flywheel in California for instance. Uh, and we had, of course, a presentation during the session before on the neuroscience gateway. Uh, regarding data, uh, the situation is more or less the same. There is Coins, Girder, Loni, Loris, Redcap, and Exnat, just to mention the, the main ones. Uh, the thing is that all these platforms are being developed for usually for specific purposes, so either subdomains or they have specific features. And it's becoming more and more of a challenge to actually integrate them and to make them in interoperate. So in the next few slides, I'm going to focus on uh, VIP and Seabrain, which are the two platforms on which the, the remaining of the talk is based on. So VIP is a platform that we developed at CNRS in, uh, in Lyon. Uh, it has a web portal, uh, basically offering to people a way to... Uh, so I'm not sure if this is working. Yeah. So it has a web portal offering to people a way to start applications and monitor them. Uh, it's uh, based on the European grid infrastructure, so it's a, it's, a, it's a big computing infrastructure with more than 100 sites distributed in, Euro distributed in Europe and beyond. Uh, we consume about uh, 30 CPU years every month uh, and we have applications in a variety of uh, domains related to medical imaging, including neuroimaging. Uh, so the project started in 2009 and as of today there are more than 900 registered users who use it and uh, publish with uh, the platform uh, on a regular basis. Seabrain now is a, a project uh, started in Alan Evans lab uh, at McGill. Uh, it's uh, basically an integration platform for tools, data, uh, visualization software, uh, uh, and uh, high performance computing sites. Uh, the service in, uh, in uh, Montreal is based on the leverages the Canadian grid infrastructure, so you can see uh, a snapshot of the, of the various sites on the top right of the slide. And it also includes a, a variety of different tools for data processing uh, and simulation. So in case you are interested in uh, uh, architecture, in uh, systems architecture, this is uh, how Seabrain works. It's a very uh, uh, conventional three-tier architecture with uh, APIs and clients at the top. So you can access Seabrain either, either as a human just by clicking on the portal or as an application by using the REST API. The middle layer uh, then has a variety of services. Uh, so to store data, uh, there is a central catalog to keep track of your data uh, distributed on different sites, uh, to keep track of your tasks, uh, to keep track of the provenance information in case you want to see exactly what happened on a particular data set, etc. The bottom layer then uh, is the resource layer. Uh, so this is one of the features of Seabrain to be able to flexibly adapt to different computing or data providers. So there are plugins for the main uh, uh, 
batch computing systems like PBS, SGE, uh, etc. Uh, for Amazon Web Services too, in case you want your analysis to run 100% on the cloud. And for the major uh, data providers like uh, you know, SFTP, SCP, etc. CBN also has a, a plugin architecture, so if you need to install it on your infrastructure, but there is no uh, connector for this, uh, you can easily develop one. CBN is being used now for the, uh, the open science project at the Montreal Neurological Institute uh, through a connection with the LURIS uh, data platform. So the data collected at the MNI is going to be stored in LURIS and then uh, will be processable in CBrain through uh, the REST API I was talking about. Final, finally, another feature of CBrain is that it's 100% open source, and not only just open source in the sense that you can download the code and die with it, it's, it's also pretty well documented. So, you know, if you have even a small infrastructure in your lab with a few computing servers and data storage uh, distributed here and there, uh, CBrain can help you manage this infrastructure for, you, for your own needs. So this is all available on GitHub. So that's it for the advertisement uh, page. <laughs> so uh, now I would like to focus a bit more on what are the big problems uh, related to science gateways for new imaging at the moment. The first one I would like to talk about is reproducibility. Uh, actually a question that I think science gateway developers and users should wonder about when using such systems is how to not break it with the science gateway. Okay, so we are talking a lot about reproducibility, but what can we do at the science gateway level? Uh, I'm going to refer to uh, Roger Peng's definitions on uh, reproducibility. So we, we talk a lot about reproducibility sometimes with different meaning behind it. Uh, so basically what I'm aiming at in this presentation is uh, uh, to take the same data, to analyze the same data with the same software again, and to try to get exactly the same results. So this is different from replication, where in independent investigators are going maybe to acquire another data set to try to replicate the same scientific findings. Here we focus exactly on the same data set, same software, and we hope to get the same result. So how can you basically screw it up with the Science Gateway? The first thing you have to uh, care about is uh, anonymization or de-identification of data. This is a paper published uh, last year uh, from the social sciences, but I think uh, most of it also applies to uh, neurosciences. And this paper showed that the conclusions that one can draw from a de-identified data set are signific significantly different from those that would be drawn when the original data set is used. Why is that so? Well, basically, uh, when you want to de-identify data, you're going to remove uh, personal information, and then you're going to do two things to generalize which means, for instance, in your senses to replace the date of birth with the year of birth because you don't want information to be too specific, and to suppress uh, data sets that are too easily identifiable. Like, for instance, if there is a single subject who is 102 years old in your data set, then everybody is going to know uh, who is going to be this subject because there is only one, so you'd better suppress it uh, before you, publish the, you make the data available to the public. So that's a risk. Uh, uh, if you are using a science gateway that implements the, ide the identification for you, you should wonder about it. I don't have a slide on it, but uh, other anonymization methods that could matter, for instance, include defacing in, uh, in medical imaging, when you remove the face of the patient or subject so that it's not recognizable, then you may have issues in terms of reproducibility. Another maybe trivial but still important point is about uh, format conversion. Uh, this is a paper published, uh, I think in May this year, uh, showing how the conversion from DICOM to NIFTY can create reproducibility issues and can actu actually disturb a data set. So again, if the Sense Gateway promises to convert your DICOM data to NIFTY, you should at least uh, do a visual inspection of the result to, to be sure that it's, it's okay. Uh, next reason for, for for reproducibility to be disturbed by the, by the use of a science gateway is the handling of software versions. So this may uh, look like a, a geeky uh, a topic, but it's actually very important. Uh, this is a paper published in 2012 uh, showing the effect of the free surfer version on uh, actual uh, findings. 
and it was showing that uh, depending on the, on the version of the software that you're using, you could have very different results uh, uh, at the, in, your, in your study. So the conclusion of the paper was uh, that uh, users are discouraged to update to a new major release of FreeSurfer uh, during a study, so you should fix a version. Uh, I would add that uh, you should make sure that the Sense Gateway precisely identifies software versions and are not going to make updates without your consent, basically. Uh, and I would add another, add another message to, uh, this time to the software developers, is that actually software developers should be encouraged to use version tracking and tagged releases as much as possible. Because if we're trying to share code in a science gateway, and this echoes what, uh, what JB was saying uh, in, the, in, the, in the previous talk, if we're going to share code and this code is not even properly uh, version tracked, then we are really running after problems. Where of course you're going to say, ah, oh, but everybody uses version tracking, uh, this is so obvious, uh, we're all using Git or you know, whatever other fancy version tracking system. Well, this is not quite the case. Uh, I've recently worked with the France Life Imaging team on uh, two Mikai challenges uh, related to the segmentation of, uh, of, um, of multiple sclerosis images and PET images. Uh, we've integrated uh, 24 pipelines over summer into VIP. And uh, among these 24 pipelines, only four used version tracking and zero used release tags. So really, this is a message to developers. If you want your code to be integrated in the science gateway, go to Git, I mean, <coughs> use Git, use GitHub, and you can see even more practical tips in, a, in this presentation from Pierre Belek. Uh, as a science gateway developers or administrators, we also hold a responsibility for this. Uh, the slide is not very nice, but it, it's uh, the beginning of our application porting workflow to CBrain and VIP. Uh, basically, step zero is to check exactly that, so that uh, your application is versioned, portable, and properly documented. And if it's not the case, then we basically advise people to try to improve their code. Still on reproducibility, uh, what else can go wrong? So after anonymization, uh, data conversion, uh, software version tracking, well, uh, there is also something to say about the operating system, the effect of the operating system itself uh, on the results. So this is a study that we published last year uh, comparing the, uh, the performance, uh, well actually the, the effect of the operating system on a variety of uh, neuroimaging pipelines uh, on two uh, of the main Linux distributions. Uh, what we can conclude from the, uh, this study is that basically the shorter the pipeline, the less, the less likely it is that uh, there will be reproducibility issues. Uh, it's explained by uh, <coughs> considerations related to numerical stability. So basically, if you take a very short pipeline, like the FSL FAST uh, that I'm showing here, uh, where the goal is to classify brain images into four classes, uh, then we see some differences between operating systems, but they, are mainly, they can mainly be considered as noise. So what you see here is a, it's a, it's a map uh, showing the sum of binarized differences between the classifications obtained on two different operating <coughs> systems. So, I mean, like, for instance, a, a red dot of this color means that, uh, and this is, sorry, this is a sum on 150 subjects. So a red dot means that among, among 150 subjects, one subject was, had differences uh, at this voxel. So you can see that it's really a noisy pattern. If you take a, a longer pipeline, and uh, uh, the example is on FSL first here, so segmentation of subcortical structures, uh, you can see that differences can actually be more important, uh, especially if you look at this uh, yellow region here, uh, you can see that the segmentations are really uh, different uh, on, the, on the two different operating systems. Uh, we measure dice, co dice coefficient, coefficients down to 0 0.6, uh, which, I mean, given that uh, the, the variable was, was the operating system, is actually quite worrying. Uh, we made some detailed analysis to try to explain why, uh, where these differences were coming from. And if you take an even longer pipeline, so we took FreeSurfer in this case, and you compare uh, its execution on two different operating systems, uh, then we can even reach st statistical significance in some regions. So this is also a bit worrying if 
the studies is run on multiple operating systems. So that's a message to uh, Science Gateway users and developers that the operating system should really be fixed uh, when conducting a study. So fixing, fixing the operating system is not actually so easy, uh, especially uh, if we are talking about systems that use uh, high-performance computing sites and mul uh, many of them, uh, because the Sense Gateway developer or adm administrator doesn't uh, always control the operating system that are deployed on the different sites. It's up to the system administrators on, on these different sites. So how, how can we solve that? Well, the current answer to this is containerization. So it's actually a way to avoid reproducibility issues, and I'm, I'm going to say a few words on this. So containers have been around actually forever, since uh, the 1990s or even 80s, I think. Uh, there are very early projects uh, um, on that, but they, they recently emerged, especially with the Docker system that I'm sure you've, you've heard of. of. So why are containers uh, so interesting and useful? Uh, containers provide a virtualization uh, <coughs> framework at the level of the operating system, which means that to the contrary of regular virtual machines, you're not booting a, a, whole, a whole complete machine, but you're using the, the already booted system, a Linux kernel in most of the cases, and you're just switching the context on top of this booted system, which means that you can, develop a you can deploy a complete operating system on top of a, an existing booted machine. So why is it nice? Uh, well, basically, uh, containers are booted much faster than traditional virtual machines, which means that we can actually boot one container per task. You know, it only takes a fraction of a second to boot a new container. So this is, this is interesting because uh, you don't have to actually wonder when and how to deploy your virtual machines. You just boot one container per task. Uh, this is true especially for Docker, but the ecosystem is very easy to use too. It's available on most systems, it's well documented and actively de developed, which means that tool developers can package their own tools, uh, as opposed to Science Gateway administrators uh, doing this for them. And containers are also easy to share and, and search. So many projects have emerged, uh, so Docker was uh, one of the first ones. Uh, today we are talking about Singularity and others, uh, and all these projects are uh, federated in the op Open Container Initiative. However, containers are not perfect. Um, if you don't like computers, maybe you should check your email now, because this slide is going to be a bit technical. Uh, so this is just an illustration of how things can still go wrong with containers. Um, so here you can see a, a very simple Docker file, uh, where we build a container from the MRTrix application. So this doesn't do great things, it just installs some packages, then download the MRTrix code and uh, install it. These are, these are the command to actually build a container. And this is an example of, a, of a co the container running on one particular machine. Uh, so this command is docker run, you, you run your, your application, everything goes well, you have your data at the end, and the files are here. Now this shows uh, the execution of this container on another machine. Uh, so we run exactly the same command, the container is transferred, and then we have an illegal instruction, uh, error message. Uh, so th this actually breaks reproducibility and we could wonder why uh, containers behave differently in these two machines. And the answer is actually because uh, the compilation step was architecture specific, so it was very dependent on the hardware, and uh, as I was saying before, uh, the hardware is not virtualized in containers. So this is one of the cases where containers can go wrong. Uh, based on that, we, are, we have started a year and a half ago the Boutiques Initiative, so to help uh, people share tools uh, between different science gateways. So Boutiques is a framework that aims at reducing tool voting time uh, en enabling tool sharing across different platforms and improving reproducibility in science gateways through containers. So the principle of uh, boutiques are as follows. Uh, basically, uh, all the tools are supposed to be implemented into a container. So we support Docker at the moment, but we are talking about supporting Singularity and other types of containers. So this is one thing. You ship your implementation as a container, but still this is not enough because you need to describe to uh, how 
the executables in the containers are going to be invoked. So this is the, the role of the second part of Boutique, which is a, a JSON language to actually describe what are the parameters of your application, how they are supposed to be invoked, what are the dependencies be between these parameters, etc. So such a JSON description could uh, seem straightforward, like you, know, you just describe the inputs and outputs of your application. Actually, the reality is a bit different because tools can be very complex. Uh, most of the tools uh, that we use in neuroimaging now have dozens of parameters. These parameters have dependencies between them. Like if you use uh, parameter A, then you're not supposed to use parameter B unless parameter C is defined, for instance. Uh, these parameters have types. You know, you can have complex types like lists of, uh, of uh, various types. Uh, and these parameters are also grouped into consistent sets uh, related to a particular um, um, aspect of the, of the application. So as our assumption with boutiques is that we should extensively support this because uh, if, if the application is well described uh, with all the constraints on the parameter, then it means that we can do more validation at the Science Gateway level and it means less errors at the end of the day for the users. So this is just a, a, a simple video snapshot uh, showing uh, how FSL bet was implemented in CBrain before boutiques. So we could see that, for instance, for this parameter, users could enter uh, negative values while this is not permitted. Uh, all the f so first of all, we, have also a we had a reduced number of parameters, and uh, there was no real consistency checks between the different flags, uh, because it takes time to implement all this and effort, and there are a lot of tools uh, uh, where this is required. And with boutiques now, uh, so I, I should say that this is all automatically generated from the uh, JSON descriptor of FSL bet. Uh, you can see that uh, we have more, uh, much more parameters. Uh, we have more checks as well. Uh, I'm not sure if it was clear, but yeah, if we put a negative number, uh, it's automatically detected that this is wrong. Uh, we have also, uh, I'm going to show this maybe, we have parameter groups, and if we click on a flag, then it automatically disables uh, the other ones, uh, etc. So the message is, if we all share our tools and describe them consistently, then we can have better validation at the Science Gateway level. I'm going to conclude the talk by a few words on uh, interoperability, uh, starting with the note that, uh, okay, let's be realistic, not everybody is going to use the same Science Gateways. I mean, software is uh, has a an expiration date. Uh, at some point it becomes obsolete. Uh, um, it requires a lot of maintenance and it just makes sense that different groups are going to still uh, develop their own science gateways for their own needs. Uh, so what can we do with that? Uh, one approach would be to say um, we could all uh, adopt a centralized platform for reproducible science. So there are actually a few a system that advocates that at the moment. Uh, of course, it's easy. If we all used, let's say, Google Doc, like a, a central system, it's very easy to share your data or your documents with others because everybody's using the same system. Uh, you can easily share code, of course. Uh, it's easy to rerun analysis because everybody's basically using the same computer, I mean, the same platform. However, there are also important scalability issues, uh, sustainability issues, what happens if this platform dies. Uh, privacy and governance issues, so do we really want to give control to this central place? Uh, maybe not. So instead, uh, the model that we are uh, looking after is uh, really a model similar to the, what the web is today. Uh, so it's a decentralized network of Science Gateway platforms. Uh, so we envision a, a, a common network where different Science Gateways could emerge and connect to this network and provide maybe different kinds of services. So the types of services provided in this network would be uh, actually different depending on the domain, on the, on the type of data addressed. We could have uh, uh, data storage platforms, computing platforms, tool repositories, uh, search engines, of course, are critical uh, in this respect. And in this model, the, the game becomes a little bit different because uh, you know, everybody could start their own science gateway if they wanted. 
uh, connect them to the network. Of course, it doesn't mean that there wouldn't be central hubs with more power and importance, but things would be more open and decentralized, which I think is a, um, um, uh, required in an open science environment. So what do we need to do this? We basically need two things. We need common repositories of tools and data, and we need common interfaces, so common APIs, to consistent, consistently and uniformly access all these different science gateways. So there is, of course, a whole talk to make about common repositories and common APIs. Um, I'm just going to uh, mention again the boutique system, so tool sharing. Uh, I mentioned it before as a way to facilitate the tool integration in science gateways. Actually, it could also become a way to share tools <coughs> between different science gateways. Uh, uh, today, we have uh, connectors from the NIAC and NIPIPE uh, frameworks to boutiques. So you can export tools from NIAC and NIPIPE to boutiques. And you can, once uh, the tool is available in boutique, you can import it in VIP, in CBrain, and in the Pegasus workflow engine. Uh, final word about uh, APIs. Uh, in the France Life Imaging Infrastructure, we are uh, designing a common API for science gateways related to neuroimaging developed in France. Uh, so this API is called Carmin for a common web API for remote pipeline execution. It's still work in progress, but it already allows uh, clients to consistently start and stop pipelines in different platforms to monitor their executions to access files and directories, to access study, and to administer users. So having common APIs is useful for interoperability. We, uh, I asked this question to the speaker uh, at the previous session, but I really think that uh, INCF could maybe play a role into standardizing APIs uh, in the different science gateways. And it also opens a whole new set of services, um, basically, once these science gateways are connected into a global network, we could think of common benchmarking services, like to benchmark a, uh, the execution of a tool in different science gateways. We could think of a credit services, like for instance, to, uh, if you want to know uh, which tools are used across the network, we could have services for that, etc. So it's, it's, it's re it, would, it would really open a whole new set of, uh, of services. So, I guess I'm going to stop here. Uh, I just want to uh, thank uh, all these people for, for their work and support and contributions, and of course you for your attention. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Tristan, for a comprehensive overview of, of the issues that are facing us. Uh, questions for Tristan? And thanks for the talk, uh, very interesting. Um, I definitely agree with you that we need some kind of a re-executable Docker container or any other technology. But if we, if we take a pragmatic approach of that right now and say, I have my tool package as a Docker container, I want to run it on, on EGI, on Biomed, or on an HPC cluster. Uh, there's no Docker engine running on these infrastructures. Uh, do you have any solutions for that right now, or do you, did you start thinking about this kind of stuff? Yes, of course. Uh, thanks for the question. So there, there, are, there are various aspects to it. Um, first of all, there are solutions to run Docker on uh, high-performance computing clusters. In Canada, we have one cluster with, I think, 20,000 nodes supporting Docker. Uh, so it, I think one of the things we can do is to try to convince system administrators to install Docker. Uh, the second answer, if, if it doesn't work, we can still use clouds. <coughs> I mean, clouds are also emerging, including in EGI. There is an EGI federated cloud where you can basically be root on any virtual machine, therefore install Docker and run it if you want. And the other aspect is Docker is not the only container system. Uh, Singularity in particular has been developed especially for that, so to simplify the deployment on high performance computing clusters. And there are also other initiatives that allow you to deploy containers without having to have administrative access. So the question is now today what type of container system we should use? Uh, 
it could be a bit worrying uh, and uh, you know stressing to to make a decision now and uh, uh, what's going to happen in a few years. The good news is that the Open Container Initiative really standardizes um, the ways different containers formats can be translated from one to another. So, yeah. One more question? No? In that case, thank you very much. Just there was J oh, Sorry. JP but is. Uh, so, I think it's, a, it's such a great talk. Thanks, Alex, for that. Uh, just a little bit controversial. Uh, sure. When you, you know, uh, and we ran into the same problem with Rupani, we actually found like, a difference in the operating system uh, yeah. with uh, yeah. But uh, compared to the other products, I can be like, okay, for the Amigdala, the, uh, you know, the device index is very small because the Amigdala is very small, right? Uh, but compared to other problems that are more like, uh, you know, people uh, relaunching analysis with different parameters <coughs> and uh, all those things. But, you know, do, do you have a feeling for, you know, why is it really important uh, like compared to, you know, I, I kind of see that as a, I guess, a, a small part of the problem. Uh, just, just like, uh, you know. Yeah. So I definitely agree with you that this is a small part of the problem, but as infrastructure developers, I think we should get it right and solve it because there will be problem, and this I can I can guarantee that there will be pro uh, I mean biological problems where this could completely screw up the analysis. Like you know, we, if we are talking of, of dice coefficient of 0 0.6, I mean th this is really not supposed to happen. So if you are studying the amygdala and if you're using you know, sense gateway that doesn't get it right, then probably your results are going to be uh, completely, completely wrong. So, I mean, I, I'm not saying that this is a whole problem, it's only an aspect of it, but we should get it right. Yeah. 